We want to look together into the Word of God for a few minutes. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And tonight, I want us to look at the next two verses as we are making our way through this last of the epistles from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Verses 13 and 14 is our focus tonight. I want to draw your attention to them, and tonight we want to open up the meaning of these verses and see its relevance for our own spiritual lives. 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14, the Word of God reads, Paul charging Timothy, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. These verses are all about fighting for the truth of the gospel. Every generation of the church has been charged to fight for the truth that has been passed down to it. No generation is given a free pass to sit out this noble fight. The Bible calls this fight the good fight. The good fight of faith. It is the noble fight. It is the excellent fight. This fight is the spiritual conflict with Satan's kingdom of darkness in which we do all that we can to maintain the truth, the purity of the truth in this hour of history. The truth has always been under attack and always has been under assault by Satan. It was this way from the very beginning. When Satan first appeared in the Garden of Eden, he came attacking the truth. We read in Genesis 3 verse 1, "...the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made." and the serpent said to the woman, Indeed, has God said? Do you hear the hiss of the serpent in that? Casting doubt upon the word of God, this is the frontal attack of the devil. And then Satan outright denied the word of God. In Genesis 3 verse 4, The serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. God had said, in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. But Satan says, you surely shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. From the dawn of civilization... Satan has cast doubt upon the Word, he has distorted the Word, he has diluted the Word, he has denied the veracity of the Word of God. Satan is a liar, and he is the father of all lies. And his satanic attack has continued down through the centuries in a full-out attack upon the truth. He has been relentless. Now, there has never been a generation in which the truth is not under assault. Consequently, we as the people of God must be always retaining and guarding, retaining and guarding the truth. And we must be like Nehemiah on the wall with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. With the trowel always building up the work of God in a positive way. But with the sword fending off the enemies of God in a polemic way. It is not either or, it is both and. A trowel in one hand, a sword in the other. Building up and fending off. Shepherds must be always doing the same. Elders and pastors must always be doing the same. Both feeding the flock and fighting off the wolves. This is what Paul is charging young Timothy. He is charging him as his young son in the faith that he must retain the standard of sound words. And the very fact that he must retain them means that it is always under attack 
and there is a strong enemy who is seeking to take the truth away. And we must always be guarding this treasure, guarding the truth that has been entrusted to us, for there is a serpent who desires to steal away the truth. Look around at most churches, many churches, Look around at seminaries, look around at Bible colleges, look around where the truth has once stood strong, and what we see dotting the landscape of America are empty buildings that once were the temple of truth in their hour, but who have succumbed to the lies of the devil. May the Lord use this to fortify our own hearts and our own resolve. May the Lord give us a belly to fight. May the Lord put something within our soul that we would be willing to engage in warfare for the cause of truth. Now, I want us to note, as we look at these verses, three things. We must retain the truth. That's very obvious from verse 13. We must guard the truth. That's very obvious from verse 14. And we must also live the truth. That will become obvious at the end of verse 13. Retain the truth, live the truth, guard the truth. This is Paul's charge to Timothy, and it is timeless, it transcends generations, and it is God's charge to us as we gather tonight. Let's begin in verse 13. Paul says we must retain the truth. That is number one. Notice how verse 13 begins, retain the standard of sound words. The word retain is an imperative command. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. Timothy is charged by God through Paul to retain the standard of sound words. This word retain means to hold on to to keep it in your grasp, to never let go of it, to keep it, to preserve it. Timothy is to retain the standard of sound words. Now, this standard is the plumb line by which all else is measured. This standard is the truth of the Word of God. This word for standard was used of of a writer's outline, or of an artist's rough sketch that either the writer or the artist would come in later and flesh it out and and color it in and, and add to it. This word standard, as it would be used of a, of a rough outline uh, or a sketch, really meant it was the setting of the parameters for theology. In other words, that all that we say and all that we teach, it must be within the boundaries of this standard. Uh, This standard is defined as sound words. The word sound means healthy and that which promotes health. Listen, false teaching always spreads disease, spiritual disease. And it is the teaching of truth that spreads health to the soul. What health is to the body, sound words is to the heart and to the soul. To hear the truth and take in the truth promotes that which is of spiritual health to our soul. 1 Timothy 1, verse 10, refers to sound teaching. 1 Timothy 6, verse 3, refers to sound words. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, refers to sound doctrine. And so does Titus 1, 9, and Titus 2, 1, sound doctrine. Titus 1, verse 3, and 2, verse 2, refer to being sound in the faith. And Titus 2, verse 8, refers to being sound in speech. This is a favorite word of Paul. Sound doctrine, sound words, sound speech, sound in the faith. Everything that comes from our mouth must be sound. Uh, it, It must be that which is spiritually healthy 
and that conforms to the standard of sound words. Uh, There is a definite outline of doctrine that has been revealed by the prophets and the apostles and has been recorded in God's Word. Now, let me draw your attention to a few key words here. Notice the second word. Notice the definite article, the. Retain the standard of sound words. That word, the, is a critically important word because it tells us that truth is singular. The definite article says that there is the standard of sound words, not a standard, meaning one of many sets of truth that are out there, and just like someone would go and pick out designer clothes, and it's like, no, I don't want this set of clothes. I want this look. I want this design. We never approach truth that way, that there are different systems of truth that are laid out before us, and it becomes a personal preference. No, there is only the standard of sound words. Truth is a single entity. It does not exist in bits and pieces of unrelated ideas and disconnected data. It all fits together like a tapestry, all the threads being woven together in which there is one standard of sound words. It is always internally consistent. And it never contradicts itself. The standard of sound words never is at variance with itself. Truth always speaks with one voice. And it is always in perfect agreement with itself. Francis Schaeffer wrote years ago, Christianity is not a series of truths in the plural, but rather spelled out with a capital T, close quote. In other words... The truth presents one body of divinity. It prevents, presents one world view. It presents one origin for the universe, one problem for the human race, one way of salvation, one way of holiness, one standard for the family, one plan for human history, one consummation of the age. There is the standard of sound words. James Montgomery Boyce asserts, quote, Truth holds together. There is no phase of truth that is not related to every other phase of truth. In other words, you tell me what you believe about one thing in this area, I'll tell you ten things that you believe in other areas because all of the truth is interconnected, it is one standard of sound words. You pull a thread here, and there is a ripple effect over there. It is all tightly connected and tightly wired together. Boyce goes on to say, all things that are true are part of the truth and stand in proper relationship to God, who is himself the truth. Now, there's another word that I want to draw your attention to. Not only the word the, and we're just mining and digging for the moment, but the word words. Do you see the standard of sound words? The emphasis is upon the objective revelation of God's written words. Truth is not determined by personal feelings. Truth is not conveyed by private intuitions. Truth is not subjective. Truth is objective. Truth is propositional. And it is stated in words. And these words are narrowly defined and have rational definitions. The truth is revealed in precise terms that communicate real, unmistakable meaning. Truth is black and white as it is recorded and revealed in clear words. Truth is definite. It is definitive. It is conclusive. Truth is not uh, abstract. It is not vague. It is not nebulous. It is accurately stated 
and narrowly defined by the meaning, the fixed meaning of words. Thus, truth can be observed, truth can be discussed, truth can be studied, truth can be analyzed, truth must be believed, truth can be proclaimed, truth can be defended. Because truth is stated not by feelings, but by objective, rational, coherent words. This is the emphasis that Paul is making. Retain the standard of sound words. Then he goes on to say, which you have heard from me. These words were meant to be preached. These words were meant to be taught verbally, and they were meant to be heard by Timothy. The truth was to be conveyed verbally, and then it would be recorded in the pages of New Testament Scripture, and it would be passed down not only to Timothy, but to all who would take up the Word of God to read it. And as Paul says, which you have heard from me, these sound words are apostolic words. That is to say, they are authoritative words. As they come down from Paul to Timothy, they come from an apostle in the church, and they carry the very authority of God Himself. Truth is sovereign. The words of the apostles and the words of the prophets and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ are sovereign over the church. This truth speaks with the supreme authority of God Himself. In fact, the truth roars with the sound of many waters, and it drowns out every other voice. Thus, truth is never a suggestion. Truth is never optional. Truth is commanding. Truth is arresting. Truth is directional. Truth makes demands upon our lives. Truth demands our undivided attention whenever we hear it. Truth lays hold of us, and it draws us up close. Up close. Truth calls us. Truth summons us. Truth mandates our complete compliance. Truth necessitates our response to it. And our eternal destiny is ultimately defined by our response to the truth. Therefore, this standard of sound words, it is a fixed standard. Timothy could not move his ministry nor move his message one step away from this standard which he had heard from Paul. The standard is immutable. God does not change and neither does his truth. Truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right is always right. Wrong is forever wrong. Society may try to redefine morality. Culture may try to reclassify its mores. But the truth is forever the same. It transcends generations. It transcends national boundaries. It transcends continents. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your truth is settled in heaven. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. Every jot, every tittle is fixed and it is established. The world changes, kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall, people come and go, fashion changes, culture changes, society changes, Washington changes, but truth remains unchanging. It is permanent. It is fixed. It is established. It is inflexible. It is unvarying. It is constant. It is lasting. It is enduring. It is timeless. It is unchanging. 
Therefore, the truth is always up to date. The truth is always current. The truth is always contemporary. The truth is always relevant for our lives. The truth always addresses the issues of the day. It addresses the issues of every day with penetrating insight. It is never outdated. It is never obsolete. It is never expired. Truth never tires. Truth never wanes. Truth never ceases to be true. Therefore, we must retain it in every generation, in every place, in every situation. The truth is never up for debate. The truth is never negotiable. We will seek to grow to understand the truth more carefully and more completely, but the truth is fixed, and so therefore it is incumbent upon every church, every shepherd, every elder, every pastor, every teacher, and every Christian to always hold fast to the truth, to always retain the truth. We are a church that is built upon the truth. We are a church that teaches and sings and reads and prays and preaches and evangelizes with and proclaims the truth of the Word of God. And no wonder we read Paul telling Timothy, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me. No ministry will ever be successful in heaven's eyes that lets go of the truth. Now second, not only must we retain the truth, but we must live the truth. And at the end of verse 13 are these words, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This speaks to how the truth is to be retained. And the truth is to be retained in faith and in love, and both are in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the very environment in which the truth is to be retained. It is to be retained in the faith and in the love which are in Christ Jesus. So, let's look at this more carefully. What Paul is saying is there must be the living reality of the truth in the lives of those who seek to retain it. In other words, we cannot retain it, but fail to live it. We cannot hold fast to it without it holding fast to us. There must be both aspects. Now, when he says, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, he's referring to in the sphere of faith and love, which are both in Christ Jesus. In other words, the truth is to be preserved in our faith and in our love. We are to have faith in one hand and love in the other as we hold tenaciously to the truth. George Knight, who is an outstanding commentator on the pastoral epistles, writes that faith and love form, quote, the atmosphere in which the sound words are to be preserved, close quote. Knight goes on to say that the principles in which sound words are to be held are the principles of faith and love. Now, when he says faith, he is referring to the fact that we must have strong faith in God as we hold to His Word. To have strong faith in God means that we believe that the Bible is exactly what it claims to be, and that ultimately is a step of faith. 
I preached a message this summer on 10 reasons why you should believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And we can stack up powerful evidence after evidence after evidence that reaches to the clouds. But there still is an element of faith on our part. A step of faith in which we trust that the Bible contains the voice of the living God, and we are to believe that God's Word will not return to Him void. We are to believe that God's Word will accomplish all of His good pleasure. And as we minister the Word of God, we are to have explicit faith that God will honor His Word. How can we retain the Word of God and yet minister it with doubt, uh, with uncertainty, with question marks uh, about our faith? No. Our heart needs to be full of certainty and full of confidence that the Bible is what it claims to be and that the Bible will do what it claims to do and that it will not return to God void that it is the very word of the living God. It is seed that contains life. It is a mirror that reveals ourselves. It is milk that satisfies. It is meat that gives strength. It is is the, the word of the living God. That is what he is saying here when he says at the end of verse 13, we are to retain the standard of sound words in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Every preacher here tonight should preach with great faith. Every teacher of the Word of God here tonight should teach with great faith, believing that God desires His Word to go forward and that God will honor His Word. Every father, every mother, every grandparent here tonight must have great faith that as they speak the Word of God and as they distribute the Word of God and share the Word of God and bear witness to the Word of God in whatever context in which they find themselves, that this is the pure, unadulterated truth of the Word of God and God will honor His Word. He also mentions love. Not only should there be faith in our hearts, Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there should also be love. Notice, in the faith and love. Faith in one hand, love in the other, and this love which also is in Jesus Christ. And this says, as we retain the truth of the Word of God... It must be done so with ever-increasing love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Love that is focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that we can say love that spills over for those who are around us. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, these verses with which you are very familiar, the same Apostle Paul says... If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Faith so as to move mountains, truth so as to speak as angels, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. This is why Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 15, we must be always speaking the truth in love. And so this is the fact that we must live the truth. As we retain the truth, we must be living the truth. As we hold fast to it, the the truth must be holding fast to us. And there must be great faith in our hearts 
that God will honor His Word. A young preacher once came to Charles Haddon Spurgeon and said, Mr. Spurgeon, when I preach, no one is ever saved. What is wrong? Spurgeon said, when you preach, do you believe that people will be saved? Do you have confidence that the God of heaven and earth will be at work to save? And the young preacher said, no, I have little faith, almost no faith that anyone will be saved. And Spurgeon said, then that is why no one is being saved because you are not retaining the standard of sound words with faith and love in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a word for us that should challenge every one of us here tonight as we seek to spread the seed of the Word of God to others around us. Let us have a positive faith in God that God will honor His Word. There's a final heading that I want you to note tonight as we look at simply these two verses. Not only does Paul tell Timothy to retain the truth and live the truth, but finally in verse 14, very obviously to our eyes, we look at verse 14, he says we must guard the truth. Now this goes yet further than, than simply retaining sound words. To retain sound words, we hold fast. But when we guard them, we are ready to do battle to defend them. Now, in verse 14, he says, Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. We must guard it. As a soldier would guard a city under the threat of attack. So Timothy is to be vigilant, and Timothy is to be alert, and Timothy is to guard the truth of the gospel from the many enemies that would seek to break in and to capture it. Paul has already told Timothy this. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 20, Paul said these very same words. He said, Oh, Timothy... Guard what has been entrusted to you. Guard it from whom and from what? We must always be guarding the truth against false teachers and false teaching and guarding against the compromises of those who are true believers but who teach the Word of God so as to round off the edges and who make concessions of the truth and who delude the truth, and who water down the truth. We must guard the truth that it always maintains its full potency as it goes forth. Now, this requires a great deal of effort on our parts. We enter into a battle that is a tiring and consuming battle. That is why he says, after the word guard, through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Do you see that in your Bible? The enemy that we face is so strong, and here Timothy is so weak that the task of preserving the truth, which is so demanding and so difficult, can never be carried out by mere human strength and mere human intellect. There must be supernatural power and supernatural insight and supernatural grasp of the truth if we are to guard the truth. It demands that we have the might and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It necessitates that we have His special enabling. I was on the phone yesterday with a woman, a lady who... I know who lives in another part of the country and calling to tell me that her son, who was brought up in the faith, her son, who was brought up in two of the strongest gospel-preaching churches in America, 
that her son has now wandered off into and has embraced a cult known as universal reconciliation. That in the end, everyone is saved. In the end, even the devil is saved. In the end, all are reconciled to God through Christ, which of course is a devilish lie that is belched out of the pit of hell itself. And she wants me to talk to him. She wants me to engage in, in dialogue with him and try to snatch him as a brand out of the fire, lest his soul be consumed in hell one day. These are doctrines of demons and seducing spirits, Paul says, that stand behind the, the masterminding of such intricate heresies that deny the Trinity and deny the Saviorhood and the exclusivity of salvation in Jesus Christ. How would any of us enter into spiritual warfare and try to confront someone who is of the lie with the truth of God. Well, not in our own strength, and not in our own insight, and not in our own ingenuity. There must be spiritual enablement. There must be spiritual enlightenment. There must be spiritual discernment and a supernatural grasping of the truth that is able to combat heresy and to combat errors at the most strategic points. Only God can enable us to guard the truth against the swirling heresies of the day. That is what Paul is saying. Guard through the Holy Spirit who indwells you. And when he adds who indwells you, the emphasis is upon how personal the Holy Spirit is and how internal is this help. It's not something that just lies on the outside of us. It is a work from the inside out at the deepest part of our minds and in the deepest part of our soul. There God is at work within us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure as we would confront the heresies and the lies of the devils of the devil in our day. Now this guarding through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, notice what we are to guard. And Paul now in verse 14 identifies the standard of sound words which he has addressed in verse 13. He now uses a, a synonymous expression, a synonym the treasure. Again, the definite article, the. There is only one treasure of the truth, and it is the standard of sound words. The word treasure conveys the value of it, how priceless it is. It is a prize among all prizes. We spoke of something of that today, of the kingdom of heaven is, is like a, a man who finds a treasure in a field. The truth is a treasure because it contains the knowledge of God, the knowledge of self, the knowledge of salvation, and the knowledge of the will of God. And it has been entrusted to us. Paul says, Timothy, this treasure has been entrusted to you. And this word entrusted is a word that is intended to bring to mind the whole idea of a stewardship. A stewardship is when a steward is given his master's possessions to maintain it, to oversee it, to, to guard it. It doesn't belong to the steward. He is simply temporarily given the responsibility to maintain its purity. And the day will come when the master will return to the house and he will call upon the steward to come stand before him and to give him account 
for what he had entrusted and put into his hands. The same is true for us with the truth. We are but stewards of the truth, and it has been entrusted to us. It's been entrusted to every one of us here tonight. And to different degrees, we will give an account on the last day to our Master regarding how we have retained it and how we have lived it, but also how we have guarded it. That's why James says in James 3 verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. A stricter judgment. We will stand as a steward before his Master and give an account for the Master's possession that was entrusted to us in the truth. Did we study it diligently? Did we rightly divide it? Did we retain it? Did we put it into practice with faith and love? Did we guard it against the encroachments of this age that would seek to distort it, that would seek to dilute it, that would seek to delete it, that would seek to add to it. So important is this, that when Timothy came to the very end of his life, excuse me, when Paul came to the very end of his life, at the end of this book, as Paul gave final words, as though they were to be etched Upon the tombstone over his grave, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. When we come to the end of our lives, what will be important is did we keep the faith? Did we fight the good fight? And did we finish the course that the Lord had set before us? These words that Paul gave to Timothy are meat and they are drink for our souls tonight. May we be those in this generation who go, more than, who go further than just nominal Christianity. May we go further than just cultural Christianity. Christianity. May we go further than just casual Christianity. May we be those who retain and guard the truth on the front lines of spiritual warfare and hold high the banner of truth for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, these are sobering words. These are words passed down as from a general to his underling who would be stepping forward into a lifetime of battling for the truth. Lord, these very words have been passed down to us Each of us here tonight have different places in the body of Christ. Each of us here tonight have a different role to play in the church. Those in spiritual leadership and those given a ministry to in some way teach the Word of God, great responsibility is laid at our feet. And Lord, may we be those who hold fast to the truth. But every one of us here tonight even by the support that we give to those who are on the front line. May all of our influence, may all of our strength, may all that we are be in one way or another invested in retaining and guarding the truth in this hour of history. Lord, make this church a fortress for the truth. Make this church a refuge 
and a tower for the truth. Make this church a bastion and a stronghold for the truth. And may you use the truth to fulfill all of your purposes here upon the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.